Welcome to API 308, where we want to discuss some questions around distributed systems and integration. One of the challenges in our industry is naming. Naming things is hard, and that's also true for talks. So I had a hard time actually naming this talk. So the talk has various sort of subtitles. You know, one fair description would be sort of two decades of integration, why a lot of things changed, but many things also remained the same. And it would also be fair to say, this is really a talk about sort of my reflections around all sorts of things that are related, connections, coupling, serverless, cloud automation, and abstractions. And a simple way of saying it is, it's the blue box talk, because we're going to see a lot of blue boxes. Many of you guys might know me. If not, if not my name is Gregor, um, the co-author of the Enterprise Integration Patterns book from now 2003, so almost there's the two decades, almost 20 years ago. Uh, during day, I'm an enterprise strategist. That means I work with our strategic customers on the cloud journey and the IT transformation. And at night, I like to dabble with our serverless solutions and particularly serverless integration. Also written some books about cloud strategy, not so surprising, and about the role of architects and architecture. So I promised blue boxes, so let's look at some blue boxes and why integration or the way we connect systems is so important. And there's sort of a mandatory slide that all my reInvent talks tend to have, and that is the slide of two systems. Two very simple systems, they consist of the blue boxes, A, B, C, and D, and that is identical. Both systems have the same blue boxes. However, they are wired together differently. And the rhetorical question is, do these systems have different properties? And the reason it's a rhetorical question is because the answer, of course, is yes, they have very different properties, right? On the left-hand side is sort of a layered stack, clear dependencies, makes it easy to replace one element with another, but also maybe have longer run times, longer latencies you could have, and you might have a point of failure. The system on the right has exactly the opposite properties, right? Much more interdependencies, harder to take something out, but shorter paths and higher levels of resilience. If B goes away, A can still talk to D. So what we see is that the way your application is connected actually determines some of the fundamental properties of that application. Well, that means the lines are nearly as important as the boxes are. I have a common rule. If somebody shows me an architecture picture without lines, I challenge people that that is not a useful architecture depiction because without the lines, you would have never known which one of these two it is. Another way to describe the importance of the lines is that as architects, it's not just about picking ingredients. When we at AWS, we have a lot of very nice ingredients. So often people see the job of the architect to select the right service. And selecting the right service is nice, just like going to the market and buying nice and high quality ingredients, but being an architect is more than that. It's not just shopping for ingredients, it's also how you put them together. That's where the tasty meal comes from. So my view is architects are much more like chefs. You're the folks who put things together and the lines represent how that is done. And that's why integration or building distributed interconnected systems is such a big part of being a successful cloud architect. So now we know the lines are important. So let's draw some lines. How hard can it be? Right? Here's system A and system B. A talks to B. Right? Easy enough. But what does this line actually represent? Is this a remote procedure call? Is this a message? Is this when? Is this synchronous? Is it asynchronous? Is this publish, subscribe? The message goes to multiple places? Or is it point to point where it only goes to one place? 
does this actually depict data flow or is it control flow? If this is polling, for example, data on control flow go in opposite directions. I poll somewhere, so the control flow goes for me, but the data comes back the other way, so the data flow goes this way. Well, kind of interesting, right? I would have to draw the line the opposite direction. And then, of course, what goes over this line, right? Is this local within one VM? Is this distributed? What is the data format? Is this a local object? Is this something in JSON, right? What is B? Is B actually a particular instance, or is B a system that might have many instances? Well, and if that you know, doesn't make it interesting enough, let's put in all the interesting problems of building distributed systems, right? It's much more likely that A and B do more than just send a single message. There will be a conversation. Where's that conversation state? Where's handling? How do you deal with partial failures? How about retries? How about item potencies? And so on and so forth. Backup, my favorite, right? I often say, um, Retry has brought more distributed systems down than all other causes together, right? So back off strategies and thinking about often and how frequently you want to retry is very important. So there is a lot behind this line. So our job as architects is to clear this up a little bit. A, to remind people, huh? You know, take the line seriously, but also be careful with statements where people say, you know, I am event-driven, so I have all these things, so I can be loosely coupled, and my teams can you know, work independently. I often see these kind of statements. Often they come in sort of the flavor a little bit of, I'm using Kafka, so therefore I must be loosely coupled and event-driven. Right? And this is, again, sort of the ingredients versus putting it together. And as architects, I feel we have a duty to clean this up a little bit, to see the different dimensions and dissect what's actually behind these kind of statements. That doesn't mean we know things better than the development teams, but it means we have sort of a more structured way of thinking about it, right? So what's behind here is there's an interaction style. This is messaging. It's not remote procedure call. For example, there wouldn't be a call stack implied in here. It is, in fact, asynchronous. It's not synchronous. It is publish, subscribe. One message can go to multiple destinations. Yes, we are dealing with events, and we'll talk a lot more about what events imply, and we can also talk about whether it's event-driven or not, because using events and being driven by events in my book are actually very different things. And lastly, you know, is this in the distributed environment, or are you using this within the context of your single application. So I like to invite everybody to be very clear about these choices. Usually when you select a service, you get a bundle of these choices together, and that's okay as long as you understand the different dimensions of these design decisions that you make, right? And I sort of made a matrix here. Careful, this is not meant to be a or service selection matrix, right, where you say, hmm, if you're using AWMS K, managed streaming for Kafka, yes, you probably have most of these, right? You're likely to be using events, you're likely asynchronous, it definitely pops up. Um, Event-driven, different question. The middleware, we don't use that word much anymore, but let's say sort of the transport layer cannot make you event-driven. The application makes you event-driven. And what you do with the events is what defines if you're event-driven or just using events for some stuff. So that is not being answered here, right? And of course, you have many other choices, right? You could be using S, could be using SQS, and you could be using our managed MQ service, which has Apache MQ and uh, Rabbit MQ, Active MQ and and Rabbit MQ. So it's good to and understand what you actually after and not replace your architecture decision with the service selection. Right? The services are fantastic, but that sort of comes after you understand what of these properties you're really after. So when we talk about connecting systems, there's sort of a magic word, there's a you know, little way around, and that is the word coupling. And to highlight that this isn't a new topic, one of my favorite quotes, Uncoupling is actually from David Orchard, and he used to work at BEA. Yeah, many of you guys might remember BEA was actually founded in 1995. I don't have the exact date of 
old, but it's around this time. So this is like 20, 25 years ago, where somebody said, well, if you want to make your systems really loosely coupled, the easiest way to do that is to not actually connect them. Unfortunately, that won't be doing anything useful, so we're somewhere on this spectrum, right? You gotta connect them, they're gonna be coupled, so the question is, how much of this coupling do you want? And first, what we need to do is we don't like bus so much. I have a lot of people who come like, oh, everything must be loosely coupled. I'm like, what does that actually mean, right? So to me, coupling is a measure of independent variability, or vice versa, you could say dependency between systems. Make a change over here, does that imply a change over there? Change can be both at design time, like I'm making a change to my system, but change can also happen at runtime. There's a problem over there. High latency or system is being, being down, right? That is another form of change that can either propagate through the system or not. Nothing is ever free. Decoupling systems is nice because it reduces that dependency and increases your independent variability, but it comes at a cost both at design time, more moving parts, I need to deal with maybe partial failures and asynchrony and temporal kind of issues, and at runtime, right? I might have marshalling and unmarshalling for my messages, right? It clearly cost me something. And the other thing I'm always careful about with the buzzwords, right? It's not like you're coupled or not coupled. Right? People use this like, oh, we must be loosely coupled as this is sort of like, as if it is sort of a bit you can set. It's actually much more multidimensional and it's not sort of binary, it's not on or off. So we as architects have also a duty to clear up our language, right? Some people believe that using buzzwords makes you look smart. I always say it does the exact opposite. It makes you look not smart. And worse yet, it sort of, you know, has the danger of making other people feel stupid. If you're using these buzzwords that maybe other folks don't understand, right, they don't feel particularly great about it, and they won't like you for it. So using buzzwords makes you unpopular. It's not a good thing. So we've got to be able to explain what is behind it. So first part we already said is a measure of dependency, if you're coupled, you're more dependent, and if you're decoupled, you have more independent variability because you have less dependency. Now, why is this even interesting, right? It limits the change and the error radius, you know, two quite separate topics, right? When is this most useful? Well, if you have a lot of change. If you don't have a lot of change, limiting the change radius is actually nearly as useful. So what we can do, and this is sort of the architect elevator I showed the book at the beginning, is bringing these concepts that are very technical in nature, right? Coupling is obviously something, right? We, that's like engine room vocabulary, right? That's stuff that we deal with as architects when we design systems. So the notion of the architect elevator is bring those discussions up to a broader level of audience without sacrificing the substance of the concept that you're dealing with. So you can have a conversation like this. You know, why do you want loose coupling? Because it limits the change radius at design time, and it can limit the error radius if something goes wrong at runtime, right? If you have asynchrony and your consumer is intermittently down, the upstream systems probably don't have to deal with this. So you limited the error radius. Well, why is that useful, right? Limited change radius allows you to make changes more quickly, you gain higher velocity and higher agility, and a smaller error radius makes more reliable, more resilient, and more tolerant systems. And the price that you pay for this is, right, there's some runtime and design cost, and there's probably some complexity. So now you can have a whole different discussion. The mistake that we always make is we think sort of step two and three is obvious. And when I tell people like, oh, it limits, the, it decouples the dependency, everybody must think, oh, that is fantastic. We don't believe the translation adds a lot of value. My experience is exactly the opposite. The translation costs you maybe 10 or 20 words and is extremely valuable. It allows you to communicate with a much broader audience. And then if once you have this understanding, if you want to in, you can go into all the facets, right? I said coupling is not binary. It's not like you're coupled or not. 
right? It's all about shades of gray, and it's also about different dimensions, right? I talk to another system. How do I address that other system? Is it a hard-coded IP address? Is it a DNS lookup? Is there another kind of naming system? Am I communicating in native data structures, or do I have something like JSON? Am I temporary, uh, temporarily coupled? If the other system is slow, will I also be slow, or can I be asynchronous? Data formats, with all the fun nuances, anybody who does integration, you have these fun things. It's a missing field, the same as an empty field, the same as an empty string or a null value, right? That's where all the fun comes from. All these are forms of coupling, right? These are assumptions that the systems make in order to communicate with each other. So it's good to have these kind of checklists, and now you can see that little buzzword about, oh, let's make things loosely coupled, actually has a lot of richness to it. Now, luckily, there's a book coming. I did a, a manuscript review. Flat is having a book coming out early next year on coupling in system design. So I very much recommend that. And he's building a lot on prior research on this topic, but packages it in a way where it's very nicely approachable. Not just about distributed systems, but also about coupling between your source code. What I like about it, it breaks it down into three dimensions. The first is like sort of what is the strength of the coupling? Am I calling an API or I'm going straight into somebody else's database, right? That makes a big difference. Then if coupling and decoupling is about limiting change radios, the second important consideration is, well, how far apart are these pieces really? Right? If these are two methods in the same class, then coupling probably isn't so bad because the distance isn't very high. So the longer the distance gets, the more this coupling should concern me. That's systems we talk about coupling so much. So that's the distance. And then, of course, the last one is the volatility. If I have coupling but nothing ever changes, I'm probably still okay. If I have a high rate of change, then this coupling and a long distance and a strong coupling, then I'm probably in trouble because I get all this crazy change propagation where it's sort of pulling the thread on the sweater, right? If I want to do something over here, my whole system falls apart. So by deepening our thoughts around these kind of buzzwords, we come to some interesting insights. For example, the way I like to express this now is the amount of coupling you want to have very much depends on the level of control you have over the endpoints. If I have full control, I can afford more coupling. And as I said, coupling or decoupling has a cost, right? So if I can afford more coupling, that actually saves me design time runtime overhead. So that might be a good decision, but only if I have control over both ends. If I don't have control, then decoupling becomes much more important because if I had change over here, I cannot make a change over there because I don't have control. And then decoupling becomes very, very important. So that's a lot behind these kind of words. And then what we really want is get rid of the buzzwords, explain why it's important, explain the trade-offs, trade -offs, and then come to insights like this that tell us, aha, uh -huh, this gives me read on when I can afford more coupling and when I need to do more decoupling. And I would say that is a key part of distributed systems design. And that leads us to our original question. Are we integrating here or are we building distributed systems? Is there a difference? Does it matter? And the interesting part is, of course, on our blue boxes line, blue boxes picture, it does look the same, right? A distributed system and an integrated system, they both look exactly like that. But there's an important nuance, and that is the context. If you're looking to the answer of the title of the talk from just the blue box on the line, you will not find the answer, right? Like you cannot tell if this is building a distributed system or whether this is integrating. The answer is in the context around this. Where does this happen? Who does it? Who does it? When does it happen? And what level of control have you? So I try to make a chart that clarifies this a little bit. So these are all in connecting things, let's say. Be careful with my words here, right? This is all connecting things. Sometimes you migrate, right? You need to get data from one 
place to another. You clearly need to make a connection, right? You're going to the cloud, you're moving your data over. That is a form of integration, right? No other way of saying it. Usually done by a dedicated team and you mostly do this single time. The other thing is you might need to synchronize data. You have a commercial system, maybe it's a SaaS system or something else commercial, and you need to synchronize that data with other systems you have. You might build that one time, it might run periodically, but the rate of change is probably generally low because most of the time this happens with commercial systems, right? They don't change as often as the applications that you build in-house, and most likely that's also done by a dedicated team. And then it gets more interesting. I'm always, you know, partly guilty for the enterprise service bus mishaps because that's what came out of the integration patterns book. But I would say the idea of the enterprise service bus was actually sound where things got a little bit iffy was the fact that it was usually done by a dedicated team. So the enterprise service bus was something that was much closer to building distributed applications because they're programmable, they look like code, you have more control over the endpoint, but people started making separate teams for it. And that started, led, it off, led to this whole bloat where the enterprise service bus team wanted to do everything in the ESB that you could have done better in the endpoint. So I would say that's a defining characteristic that it was trying to be part of the application, but it couldn't keep up with the pace and the cadence of the application, and it was being done by a separate team. And that leads us to say, we're really building distributed applications or distributed cloud applications. That is done by the same team. The lines and the boxes, the endpoints and the integration, it comes out of the same hand. And if you think about it, if you look at the AWS service portfolio in this space, you will also realize that there's very different products. And often we are asked about sort of what is the technical difference, and the answer here is the same. It is not so much about the technical difference. There's many things you can do in these services, and if you watch carefully, right, we keep adding more features that even, you know, to some extent creates more overlap between these service capabilities. The difference is when is it done, how often is it done, and who does it? They target different audiences and different context. So the answer to the question isn't in the technical aspect as much, but in the context in which you operate, right? And that's a great reminder that architecture isn't just about, you know, the APIs and, you know, getting things wired together correctly, but it is also about understanding the broader context and the level of control you have, right? Again, if you have more control, you can afford more coupling. So I promised that I was going to say a few more, more words about events. Events and event-driven architectures are a very important topic for us at AWS. We find that folks who build serverless applications start to do that from a much more event-oriented aspect. That's very welcome, but it's also time to think about, well, what does it really mean? What is a message versus what is an event? So there's different opinions here. My point of view is actually that the message is the thing that identifies the interaction style. So that means the connection between your systems is limited to sending a data record from one place to another, right? You're not making a call stack, there's no return address, right? It's really a data record that you can put on a channel, the channel gets it from A to B, and then the other side can do something with it. So it's a very simple interaction model. Now, what's in this message you can choose? You can choose the semantics of that message, and one of those semantics is making it an event. You can tell system B to do something, that's a command. You can send the document, or you can tell that something happened, and that makes it more like an event. Now, many people believe that making it an event somehow immediately makes it loosely coupled. Mm, careful there, right? Again, there's going to be a lot of nuances, and I will talk to those. Also, Martin Fowler has spent some time thinking about this and has warned against making things looking, look like an event, but actually having an expectation of what's going to happen. 
and that is sort of you know, a, a mismatch, that is no longer an event, and he has a, has a nice name for this, he calls this the passive aggressive commands. There's actually a, a nice video of his where it's sort of, you're sending this event, but really the message you're sending is like, don't you really want to do this thing next, right? It's like, here's the event, hello, like you should be doing something specific, and that's giving you a hint that that well, is no longer just an event, it's really a disguised comment. So you got to be careful with those semantics. So let's come back to the coupling story. Does using events automatically make you more loosely coupled or not? And I would say that is not as easy an equation. So when you send something from system A to B, so I picked a simple domain, right? It's like some order, you know, web shop, you, know, you order something and payment needs to be made for the order that was placed, you know, easy enough. How do you get these two systems to connect to each other? Well, one way is, you know, the order entry knows who it's talking to. It says, you know, dear payment processor, right, I have something for you to do. You would say that's maybe tightly coupled, but it's also very explicit. Instead, you can say process payment. So you're no longer worried about who processed the payment, so you gain some independent variability, right, because the kind of payment processor that you have now can be more easily replaced because you're just issuing this kind of command. Now you can, instead of the command, also publish the notification that there is a purchase has taken place, right? And the payment processor knows that huh? whenever a purchase takes place, I should be initiating payment. Or I can rephrase this to being more like an event, I can say the order was placed. Now, how about coupling and decoupling here? So from step one to step two, that's definitely a step ahead, right? Saying what you want to happen is better than knowing which system that you talk to. But having events doesn't automatically sort of make the dependency or the connection between the systems go away. You're basically shifting a little bit of the burden from the left to the right, right? In the second example, the left knows what should be happening next, but in the examples below, the right knows what happens before. Now, if multiple things happen, making this dependency upstream has some benefits, but it doesn't mean that automatically these things are decoupled. You're just changing the direction of the dependencies. And I think it's good to have clarity about that. So this is sort of the semantics, like how can I name these channels that I'm dealing with? But there's another um, whole dimension to this, right? If you want to connect to systems, how does that connection actually taking place? Here we sort of assumed it's somehow by name, right? The payment processor listens to purchase and order entry publishes something called purchase. So somehow magically purchase equals purchase. We assume that's being connected. But there's detail around this as well. In one hand, you could not actually have systems do this on their own. So maybe they don't even know that they're interested in purchases. You tell them. You create a channel and you give both sides a reference to the channel. Well, with cloud automation, we can actually do this relatively easily, right? You make an SQS channel and you give the, RN, you give the, the channel name, right, to both sides. And all they know is listen to this thing. And the fact that this thing comes from the same source, that is actually the task of an user, right? This could be your cloud formation template or your CDK code that is actually composing it, saying, hey, the thing I gave B is actually the same thing as A, so now A and B talk to each other without ever really knowing about it, right? It's a way of decoupling. The name is sort of a prototypical one, right? And you can do this with SNS topics, right? It's like, here's the topic I want to read from. You pass that, you know, B has an environment variable or hopefully not hard-coded name, but somehow it knows the name, and then they both agree on a name. What you find in a lot of pub subsystems are top hierarchies, where the name isn't a single thing, but the name is composed of multiple pieces, so you can do things like publish an event to a subdomain 
but you can subscribe to higher level notes. You get all events that are below. So some of the traditional pub sub system like Tipco, et cetera, use this quite a bit. And then the last one is just by content, right? I don't have a hierarchy necessarily in mind. I just subscribe based in content. Now again, you could say maybe content is more loosely coupled than topic hierarchy because the topic hierarchy implies that there's some sort of agreement on a common ontology, right, which you don't need if you have content. So I think you can make this argument, but also the top one is very loosely coupled because A and B know nothing about each other. The composer does that. If you map this back to AWS services, you will find that all of these are supported. And we just added one more, like SNS just got content filtering, right? By message body, it used to be able to do that only in header attributes. Now you can have the fourth model with SNS. Topic hierarchy in EventBridge, right? You have prefix matching, so you can match prefixes, and that way you can filter events based on topic hierarchy. So this is another nice example where just picking the service is a small part of the architecture. The real part of the architecture thinking is what version of this do I use? What trade-offs do I make based on that? And then I map it to the service. If you say my architecture is EventBridge, I wouldn't know whether you're doing something related to topic hierarchy or whether you're doing event filtering based on content. So these, might be careful with the word patterns, but let's say these approaches give you vocabulary. They give you a much more precise description of what you're trying to do. And both of those, or at least two or maybe three of those, can be done in EventBridge. At least two of those can be done in SNS. So just giving people the transport is not a useful answer to the core of your design decision. Right? There's a decision that you make as an architect before you choose the service. And I find that to be a very important and sometimes over step. So let's you know, talk a bit more about events. Right? Something happened, we let another system know about that something happened. Again, there's a very nice, nice uh, video from Martin Fowler already from a couple of years ago where he goes, again, through multiple variations of that. I, I often like Martin's talk because he tends to take very simple things but then dissects them in a very nuanced way. And as an architect, I find that to be very useful. So, for example, and I remember my comment about the transport cannot make you event-driven. Right? How you use these events in the application, that's what makes you event-driven or not driven. Right? That's something the system as a whole can do, not the transport itself. Because all this transport will, you know, all this will use the same transport. So first one is the event is merely a notification that something can carry a lot of data. Sometimes people actually use this as a defining quality of an event. This an event should just merely be this happened, right? I'm not so strict, right? But that exists and we call this event notification. And then if you are notified that something happens, you usually go back to the upstream system and fetch the changes. So for example, if the address changes, you sort of propagate this to everybody. The nice thing is it becomes easy to add a listener, right? That's pops up. The sender won't know how many listeners there are. Adding a listener is side effect free. So if an address changes, you can easily add other systems that are interested in address changes. And if they know about the upstream system, they can go back and actually fetch the new address. You still have some dependency, but you sort of inverted the dependency because the other systems fetch from the source. So some people might say, ah, that's still more dependency that I want. Maybe I put everything into the event. All right, so then now it's event carried state transfer. Now the event contains everything that's relevant. Sounds good on paper, much more difficult in reality because relevant is sort of one of those uh, words as architects, we should be very 
careful with, right? It's like appropriate, you know, do the appropriate thing, have the relevant data, right? It's like, well, hold on, like, how do you know what is relevant and what is appropriate? So that these words usually that I, I forbid and the same is true here, right? If you want to be decoupled and not know who is all downstream, how do you know what's the relevant data? And then the answer is, well, maybe I put all data in, right? But that might be wasteful. So it's one of the things sounds good on paper, but in reality, not as many systems actually fully follow this. Then there's something where events take a whole different role, and that's the event sourcing kind of approach. And here the events play the role of actually carrying the application state. So it's like a database transaction log almost. You can rebuild your state from the events that you had in the past. And the reason folks build those kind of systems, you know, it tends to be very special kind of systems, they do it because you can change the past. So let's say in the classic example, I think it's even one of uh, Martin's example, let's say you have a payroll system and somebody had entered the wrong timesheet and you find out that last month they actually worked an hour or more. Now, that one hour or more might have many effects that might have triggered overtime, that might have triggered a bonus, that might have put them in a different tax bracket, right? There's a gazillion things that this one hour could have caused. So with these event source systems, you can go back in time and replay those events in a corrected form, and then you can compare the two states, and you can see what you now need to do to fix a past event. So very powerful, but also very special kind of system built. So it's usually driven by a very strong business need where you need to be able to sort of go back in time, insert something in the past, and project what change that would lead to in the current time. And then, you know, I put this in here because it's in Martin's talk also, CQS, command query segregation, is a little bit less about events, but it's a notion that comment that like making an update into the system should use a different model, should use a different language than reading from it. So I put it in here more for completeness. And again, what we find here, right, this we use this word event-driven relatively loosely. So I would encourage folks to think carefully, like well, what flavor of event-driven is this actually? And we do have the vocabulary to be more precise here. So with that, come to my next topic, right? So we talked a lot about how do these events or these messages go from A to B. And one question we should ask, well, what's in the middle? Is there something in the middle, right? And there, again, we have vocabulary, right? So one classic model is the pub sub model. Some of you guys might know my pet peeve with pub sub. Right, because I think it's the worst name ever because A sub comes before pub, right? You subscribe first and then you publish something. And they're out of two completely different dimensions. Subscription is sort of a design time, one time operations. I subscribe once, but I publish repeatedly. So they actually completely differently. They just kind of rhyme. So I really, you know, it's kind of cute to say pub sub, but I find it to be actually very poor wording because it doesn't very well respect what's really going on here. But that aside, right, sort of the pub sub idea is that, you know, people express their preference about which events they want to get, and if the preference matches, right, we say it can be by topic, by channel name, or by content, they just get that event. And the format that the event is in, if it's not exactly what they needed, they have to deal with, right? And again, you can say, ooh, Ooh, that could cause some coupling, right? Because I'm not supposed to know where this event comes from, but the event has a certain format, so now I need to deal with this, and yeah, it might give me some sort of dependency in terms of change propagation, right? And then there's sort of folks who say like, ah, I'd rather do this in a central place. I have an event broker where I can do some filtering and some transformation. Right? And in some sense, you could say, oh, this looks a little bit like SNS and EventBridge, right? And you'll be actually pretty close. You know, it, in that EventBridge has more capabilities in terms of transformation. It can actually, you know, change your event formats for you so you have a central element that does that. 
Well, and then there's sort of trade-offs, right? That's a classic sort of with the design patterns. Do you want this event cloud where sort of stuff goes from you know, anywhere to, to anywhere else? Or do you want to have much more central point of control? Interestingly, in the past, the decision was also was driven by two considerations. The one is sort of the coupling and design time consideration, like who defines what talks to what and where do I define this, right? On the left-hand side, that's clearly in the endpoints. On the right-hand side, that's more centralized, right? Like EventBridge, for example, will have a target, so EventBridge will know where does this event go. But in the past, there was also a lot of runtime considerations, right? One of the reasons people left side because it was perceived to be more scalable. You didn't want to have this bottleneck, this element in the middle that has to deal with all these events. Now, interestingly, that aspect has largely gone away. In the cloud, right, you can have a logical element, right? You say, oh, I put event bridge in here, but event bridge isn't sort of a single runtime instance, right? It's an element that you configure, but it scales and distributes, so you no longer have this effect, this worry of saying, this is going to limit my throughput. It will not limit your throughput. So if you're a bit stressed about which one is the right one, is the nice thing is the pipes and filter architecture, this message-oriented style where the interaction is limited to sending a message means the sender doesn't actually know. Right? If this message goes directly to somebody else or whether it's transformed along the way, doesn't know that, so you have some flexibility here. So that's around brokering versus sort of event cloud, publish, subscribe. But there's another vocabulary that quickly comes in here. That's orchestration, right? We have step functions as an orchestrator. And the question comes, and I actually had the discussion with the service team is, well, how does an orchestrator and event-driven architecture, event processing, how do they relate? And in my point of view, they're actually quite different. And again, not sort of from a technical perspective, but more from a system design perspective. The notion of orchestration is that you have a central element, and I need to be careful now, it's a central design element. It's not a central runtime element. It's a central design element that defines what happens in which order, and the listeners are largely passive. They just need to know, if I have a request coming in, I need to respond to this, then the orchestrator knows what's going to happen next, and then it goes back from there. Right? It's basically, I have three lambdas, I have step functions, and step functions has three tasks, right? Call this lambda, call that lambda, call that lambda. All right, it's a way of decoupling. The lambdas don't need to know that they're called three in a row, but it sort of means that I have control over the system. I know the topology of my system. I know that I want A first, and I want B second, I want C third. Event-based system, let me be careful with the vocabulary here. Event-based systems are kind of different. Right? There's the assumptions that the events go between the systems fairly loosely, sort of as the system see it appropriate, right? You can just subscribe to any event. That's why we have event-based systems. So we do not have a central design element that defines our system structure, right? The system structure is defined by subscription. If another element subscribes now, suddenly there's a new thing taking place, right? If the lambda C now subscribes to events emitted by lambda B, now suddenly there is a system structure here, but that happens indirectly through these events. So what we often do in event-based systems is try to derive higher level insights out of these events that we observe. And there's many classic examples. One classic example is sort of if you have a price change in your online store, let me stay with the same domain, and immediately after you have a huge spike in orders, then you consider that a potential price mistake event happens actually quite a lot, right? So where you see independent events, or you know, I worked for a big Silicon Valley company where we had an event once where the event was a series of servers failing, and the servers all happened to be in the same rack, 
and they all happen to be sort of on top of each other. So event was server here failed, and the second event was server there failed, and server, the third one was server here failed, and that is called fire. So that's you know, making its way up the rack. So those are classic examples of deriving higher level events from lower level events. Very interesting domain right, to do these kind of things, but different than orchestration. It, it is stateful, right? You're like harvesting, you're looking at events, you, know, you have time windows, what else is coming in, but it's sort of a very upside down view of looking at your system. So to me, orchestration, event processing, you know, the, the green boxes look similar, but the way it's being used in the system is very different. Now, when I you know, talk about system design, I always want to be careful about talking about all the great things we can do, but also about things that could be going wrong. You know, AWS, we're known to be very transparent and having a shared responsibility model. So here's something straight from the documentation. And that is saying, you know, you need to read this carefully. Well, it, says, it does say it's important. Well, it is possible to make infinite loops. Right? You can make something as like you have an event coming from S3 that something changed that goes into event bridge. And what you do right, through various things, you make a change to that same bucket. Well, congratulations, you just created an infinite loop. And you will learn a lesson out of this because this infinite loop will cost you money. There's no way around it. You're consuming the resources, right? So you will be charged for this. Of course, you have sort of anomaly detection, other things that help you with this, but there are things that you need to be aware of, right? You're building complex distributed systems. And when you're writing source code, an infinite loop is probably easier to see than it is in a distributed system like this. So the reminder I want to give folks always, right, is from Leslie Lamport, very nice description of what is a distributed system. Well, it's one where a server that you didn't even know existed breaks your system, right? It's just different rules of the game. We have distributed systems. The cloud is inherently distributed. It gives us many benefits in scalability, but it also comes with some footnotes. So by making things more loosely coupled, you give your system independent variability, right? Remember, that was the very definition. The reason I decouple things is so I allow more change. Now, that means if that change is actually happening, that my system structure is evolving, right? That's what I wanted. I wanted my system structure to be able to evolve. But it also means I might not know what my system structure is right now. So many years ago, I wrote a chapter in, in this book, which is called Don't Control But Observe. Right? There's so two ways we're dealing with it. Either you control it up front, this is it, right? Then you know exactly what's happening because you define it up front. But if you make it loosely coupled, you want to allow independent variability, you want to allow your system to evolve, you need to observe what is actually going on because otherwise you're running into trouble, right? And then again, we have obviously services that help you do this just as a simple example. Like that's why you have things like X-ray. So if you build something distributed, monitoring your system, understanding the system and the system behavior isn't sort of a nice to have that I do when I get around to it, but it's actually a central part of building these kind of systems. And I've actually been doing these kind of things for, for quite a while. There's a pattern we call control bus, right? In telco, people call this sort of in-band, out-of-band, right? In-band is your actual messages, the actual data that you want to send, and out-of-band is all the management, right? All the other control stuff. Like in the old telephone days, this was like billing and hanging up the handset. That's where all these like Captain Crunch stories come from, where, where people could sort of stop the billing for the phone call, right? This was when in-band and out-of-band was mixed on the same frequency. So control bus is basically the out-of-band. It's the communication that helps you manage the system on top of getting data from A to B. And what I've like to do in the past is reverse engineer the system structure from this control bus because I'm not defining it up front because I want to be loosely coupled and distributed. So I assume the system structure is dynamic. So I want to have mechanisms to reverse engineer that. 
like X-ray does that with correlation identifiers that propagate, but there's different ways of doing it. You might have it in your automation, right? I said earlier, your composer might be a CDK script that's telling you that you know, this lambda is actually the destination of that lambda, so that's a way to build a system image. You could have that in CDK or in CloudFormation. You can wrap anything that sends or receives messages in a library. I've also seen that done. And this library does something on top. So if you subscribe, let's say, to an SNS topic, your library would also send a message on the control bus and saying, hey, this element has actually just subscribed to, the, to this SNS topic, and you can collect that data and build a system image out of that. You can see who is talking to who. Or the last one is you can actually look at the message flow, right? If you inspect the messages, it pops up, right? You can get a copy of the messages. If the messages carry a sender in it, you can see who is sending messages, and you can see who is consuming messages. And you can do some very interesting things, right? You can validate the structure, for example, um, detecting loops, right? If you have a series of subscriptions and that actually turns into a loop, then you will find that. Or if there's publishers to a topic that nobody subscribes to, right, you can find out that that is probably not the smartest use of resources, right? You can detect things. I mentioned earlier, retry is a dangerous operation, right, because the failure of the other system might not be a transient system failure. It might be an application failure because you're sending data that the other system cannot process. We call that a poison message. Right? And of course, retry will have exactly the same effect as the first attempt had, right? It will fail again. So these are classic you know, failure modes that you will have. So having good systems management should start detecting these kind of things. Of course, this is where you should have maximum retries and, and back off policies. But that, yeah, if you've written this maybe with custom code, maybe somebody didn't put it in. So your system management should detect all these kind of things. You know, Queues filling up, back pressure, right? You have a lot of dynamic behavior in the system. So behold, right? the way I say this, behold the runtime, right? You're shifting more to the runtime that buys you some nice properties, but it also means you need to spend more time thinking about the runtime. Two more things I have. And we're dealing with complex stuff here. And you guys know I like patterns. I like making abstractions. I like to give us higher level concepts to help us think about these things because they're complicated, right? So if you have better higher level constructs, it makes it easier for us to think about it. But what I learned over the years somewhat painfully that not all abstractions turn out to be good abstractions. Some of them are more like illusions. And the favorite illusion is remote procedure call. The intention was actually good. We said, why can't we make a remote procedure call look like a local procedure call? Classic abstraction, right? One more layer of interaction sort of solves most problem. Well, unfortunately, a local call and a remote call behave very differently, right? A local call is a single process. You have low latency. The call stack is given, you don't have partial failure, you have consistent state. And a remote procedure call, you have all the well-known fallacies of distributed computing. The network is not reliable, latency is not zero, you have partial failure state. So in the end, this is not a good abstraction. This is an illusion. You're pretending this thing to be something that it is not. So when we make abstractions for distributed systems, we need to be very careful about what we abstract away versus what we pass through. And one of my favorite conclusions there is failure and physics are the key things that don't respect your abstractions, right? Your abstractions are usually the functional elements of it, but the runtime elements will blow through, the, through these abstractions fairly easily, right? And this is just like RPC. Now you have partial failure, right? You made the call, nothing come back. Was the other side ever called? You know, did it fail on the invocation or did it fail on the return? No one knows, so you have a big problem. So be careful that when you build abstractions for this, that they don't become illusions. 
And the difference is, yeah, I think I took this off Wikipedia, that abstractions is it's generalizing details to focus attention on the parts of greater importance. That's good. The illusion is if you remove things that are actually important and make the user believe that it's something that in reality it isn't. And then Joe Spolsky has a very nice way of saying the law of leaky abstractions that abstractions generally leak. So one thing I've been spending time with is, well, how do you come up with these abstractions? So there's a lot of people who come to the cloud and saying, well, why is everything sort of service vocabulary, right? Why is everything like AWS has like these services and they name that and other folks have those services and they name something different. Why don't we have a higher level language? Sounds like a good idea in reality, very difficult to do to sort of reverse engineer these abstractions from the implementation. And actually tomorrow I have a talk about serverless and lock-in and I'll go into a lot more detail about why this is difficult to do. So you might do the other thing, say, well, let me not go from the bottom up. Let me not try, like, take event bridge and put some abstractions over it, but let me go top down. Like, what are the general things that I might want to do? It's a little bit better, but I would say, in the end, the best way to find abstractions is from actual usage. You know, you can't just sit in the chamber and say, like, oh, what might be useful abstractions, right? They might look good to you but then other people don't find them very useful. So the best way that I find is the abstractions come from actual usage. Yeah, and of course, that's what the patterns are, right? Like this is, you know, the 2003 enterprise integration patterns. You know, we harvested those from actual usage. And that way they became useful abstractions and it became the vocabulary that the ESBs at the time used of that vocabulary is also still relevant for serverless applications, right? We didn't look at all the ESB implementations and sort of bottom up try, somehow try to reverse engineer, but we looked at how people use these kind of things and based on that, we made the language. And that brings me to my, my last topic, and that is traditionally these patterns, you know, they've been more like paper constructs, right? They've been thinking models for you to make better designs, but the cloud changes that. So to give you an example, just from your last two minutes here, one of my applications, my, one of my examples out of the old book is a loan broker, like simple domain, right, where you know, somebody wants a mortgage loan, you, the mortgage broker talks to some different banks and the credit bureau and sort of gives you the best mortgage. So 20, almost 20 year old example. Well, these days we can implement this very nicely on serverless. And when I look at these kind of solutions, to me, these are the proverbial cloud native kind of solutions, right? For me, cloud native isn't Kubernetes. Cloud native is building a system that takes full advantage of the cloud and serverless is the perfect way to do this. Yeah, and it sends some messages, then it filters the messages and it aggregates the messages at the end. So the power of this is that now you're able to describe your system in three different languages. You have the language of the business domain, banks and loans and quotes, right? That's what your business domain does. You also have this language of patterns, filters and aggregators, publish, subscribe, and you have the language of the services. And separating those languages is very, very useful because a lot of your design decisions, and I'll also bring this up in my talk tomorrow, a lot of the design decisions are in the middle, right? And then we love the services, but the services are just the implementation mapping. The design decisions actually happen outside of this. And where it gets really cool is that you can actually code the different layers, right? You can write code for all three. Normally for the right-hand side, we use CloudFormation or you use CDK, but with CDK you have abstractions, right? You have object-oriented languages, so you can build higher level abstractions. So here you're creating a bank. This is CDK code. This is using the language of the business domain, right? Somebody's saying, oh, okay, you know, this is making a bank with these kind of parameters and it's sending the results to the mortgage quotes bus, right? The quotes that, that come back. 
So you're writing cloud automation code out of the business domain, and likewise, you can write cloud automation code for your patterns, right? You can have expressions like, make me a message filter that makes sure that this field exists, or make me a content filter that only propagates the payload. And the nice thing is these patterns are no longer patterns in a book. This is executable code. This is CDK code. And underneath, you map this, in this case, to EventBridge. And if you take this one level further, I would actually like to be able to describe my serverless systems in a language like this. Yeah? I want to have a choreography where I'm saying, I want to have from this queue, I want to have a scatter gather pattern. And with that, send it to the banks and re-aggregate the responses and aggregate them by these kind of conditions. So those are some of the things that I'm working on right now to give us a better language to actually express our topology, right? This is distributed system development, but now we have executable code that describes what your system looks like. You're coding the lines now, not just the boxes, and we have learned how important the lines are. So for me, this is a huge shift, right? Cloud isn't just here some services. Cloud is also automation. Automation is programmable in first-class programming languages with CDK. So this whole idea how you define the system is fundamentally shifting. And this has nothing to do with automation, per se. This has to do with defining the topology of your application. This is not infrastructure as code. This is really architecture as code, right? This is defining your application architecture. So with that quick recap, I think we're just at time. Oops, apologies here, right? So the lines are at least as interesting as the boxes. You're the chef, right? It's important how you put things together. It's not just about using the services, but also understanding the design trade-offs. Careful with the buzzwords, right? Understand what is behind that and understand all the nuances between events and messages. And that's sometimes the answer, technical answer, but the answer lies in the context, as in the case we had of integration versus distributed systems. And keep in mind in the cloud, automation isn't just something for repeatable tasks. Automation is something that actually allows you to code your application topology. Now, obviously, I had more to say than fit in 60 minutes, so apologies for that. So I'll leave you with some, some resources here to my blog. Two personalities I have. The one is my architect persona, and the other one is my serverless developer persona at the bottom, where you can see all the CDK things happening. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs> <laughs>